If you have a Bible, please open to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, if you like, you can pull a Bible out of the bench there in front. You might even find one on your phone, but Philippians chapter 2 today. The message is entitled, Choosing Joy. This is part 2. No matter what is going on in your life, you can choose joy. If you have the sermon notes there, you can see that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. When you become a Christian, God's Spirit lives inside of you, and one of the fruits that He brings is joy. Joy is dependent upon Christ. It's not dependent upon your circumstances. And joy is your choice. And this is what we learn from the Apostle Paul in this chapter. When you choose joy, three things happen. First of all, our God receives glory. When you choose joy, the Lord is honored before others. Secondly, we receive strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah said. Walking in the Spirit, it's like getting your second wind. You get more done when you walk with God than when you are out of fellowship with God. Why? Because sin and guilt, it, it runs you down. David said, it sapped my energy right out of me. You can't think straight when you're living in sin. Thirdly, unbelievers are drawn to Christ when they see us with joy. When people see Christians with the joy of the Lord, it creates a hunger, a desire to have what we have. How many people, think about this, how many people would want to become a Christian if they were a Christian just like you? Do you show them a Christ who is alive or dead? Do you show them a Christ who is powerful or weak? The secret of joy is found in having the mind of Christ, verse 5. Uh, that means to think and to act and to live like Christ. Would you please stand with me now as we continue on in the passage? The mind of Christ is, is a mind of humility. It's a mind of an attitude of putting others first, both at home, at work, and at church. And now we see the joy that Paul has, even while in prison. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as much in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, the children of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. May we pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the instruction we have on how to have your joy in our lives and before others. If there be one that knows not Christ, God, may you touch them, draw them, convict them, and may they receive salvation. For those who have lost their joy, today, restore to them the joy of your salvation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I have a quote there in the notes I'd like you to take a look at by Dr. Kenneth Kingston. He was an MIT professor. If you live in a society where you believe the public institutions like government are deeply flawed and not easily improved, that leaves the pursuit of individual happiness as the main goal to your energies from the mind of an unsaved man. Today, many are chasing the fantasy of personal happiness apart from a growing spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ only to become, well, to become disillusioned by the dissatisfaction they experience. This deep dissatisfaction leads to a loss of joy. It leads to an overall attitude of complaining. Enter the Apostle Paul. And so if you see with, 
Look with me on page two of your notes. Uh, by way of quick review here, how to choose joy in your life. And number one, Paul says, choose to obey God's word. I mean, it's a choice. You either obey or you disobey. Wherefore, uh, my beloved Philippians, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. I was with you, you obeyed. Now I'm gone. I want you to obey more. Jesus said, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. I shared with you a poll last week who the happiest people alive are. The people with the greatest degree of joy, the greatest degree of satisfaction, of contentment in life are people of faith. Survey after survey, year after year, not just any faith, but the Christian faith. People who worship weekly, people who participate in their local church have greater joy than others. Number two, choose to walk close to God. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It is God which worketh in you, both to do and to will of his good pleasure. Notice he said, work out your salvation. He did not say work for your salvation. You cannot get to heaven by doing good works, sacraments, baptism. Uh, you can't get to heaven by joining a church or getting baptized. That doesn't wash away your sins. So what does it mean to, to work out your salvation rather than work for your salvation? Well, the word uh, was used uh, in, in Greek literature, uh, a Roman, a Roman historian Strabo used it to describe the, the Romans in Spain working in the silver mines. And what they did is, you see, God deposited the silver in the mountains, uh, but the men had to dig the tunnels. They had to mine out the silver to get it out. It took a lot of hard work to get it out. God has deposited his salvation in your hearts once you were born again. It is our responsibility to mine out of our life that which God has put into us. And so your words, your actions, your attitudes, it takes work to bring out, work out your salvation. And so Paul uses the, the terms of I'm pressing for, I'm disciplined, I keep my body under subjection. He says we don't work for salvation, but once we become Christians, we are to work hard. We're to work hard. And so he talks about a, a soldier who fights hard. He talks about a runner who runs hard in a marathon race. He talks about a boxer who, who boxes hard. And so we, we are to work once we become Christians. Give maximum effort. Verse 13, but it's God's power that's in us. God lives inside of us. God places desires in our hearts uh, to do what he wants us to do. Did you ever get an impulse, I mean, to do something good? An impulse to do something good. Maybe it's to, to give someone a compliment. Maybe it's to uh, lend a helping hand. Maybe it's to volunteer to serve. Maybe it's to give an offering. We had a big offering coming up the end of, uh, of July. And you say, you know, where does that impulse come from? It comes from God. It's God that's working in you. That's a pretty amazing thought, that God is inside of me. And these impulses to do good are from God. We compared last week the quietist and the pietist. The quietist says, do nothing. The pietist says, do everything. God says, you do everything, and I'll do everything. And together, you'll become Christ-like, and you'll have great joy. Of all the people on the earth, we are uniquely blessed that the God of heaven is in us and working on us. He works in us, we work out our salvation. God works in us some more, and we work out our salvation. How to choose joy in your life. Uh, number three is choose to stop complaining. Verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now, what are the typical things that people complain about? What comes to your mind? One well, of your notes, life's hardships. Things that cause us discomfort and worry and pain. People that disagree with us. Uh, that, that's uh, something to complain about. How, about. how about when we feel that our rights are violated? Uh, most people tend to complain about trivial things. Don't we? About other drivers? They drive too fast. No, no, no. They drive too slow. Uh, they're cutting in and out in front of us. And when we do that, then it's just because we're in a hurry. We need to get there. Uh, what irritates you? Is it, is it the long lines? Is it the short lines? Is it any line having one person in front of you that bother you? Crying babies. You ever have a crying baby in church? 
I mean, 300 people can hear it, but the mom can't? <laughs> Do you know that in our country, every year, 1,000 infants, 1,000 infants will be injured or killed because of shaken baby syndrome. And the number one trigger is a crying baby. Some complain that their food is too cold, forgetting that 9 million people will die this year from starvation and malnutrition. Many complain about a midlife crisis, but forget that there are some parts of the world, because of disease, because of war, men die young, sparing them the stress of a 50th birthday party. We complain. How many Americans complain about their homes? They want a, a, a new this or a new that. And yet millions around the world, they live on pavements. They live in shanty towns. They live in slums in Africa, South America, and in India. You might have a problem of legitimate concern if you lived in Nagasaki or Hiroshima in 1945 because in a matter of seconds, 100,000 people died, ending the deadliest war in human history, a war that took over 70 million lives. But you don't live at that time and you don't live in that place. You live here, you live now in America, safe America. What do you see? See a red dot? See a smudge? And that kind of illustrates what most of us do. We don't see the 99% of the whiteboard. We see the dot. We see the smudge. We tend to focus on the wrong thing. It's an example of of grumbling. It's an example of complaining. Now, if you're going to obey God, then we're going to have to do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now, how to stop complaining? Here, here's a thought. If you want to stop complaining, determine to be a good finder. Learn to be a good finder. Learn to compliment that which is worthy of a compliment. The Bible commands us to edify one another. That's with our words. You see 99% of the white on the board gets unnoticed. If you would look on page three of your notes, both the hummingbird and the vulture fly over our nation's deserts. All vultures see is rotting meat because that is what they look for. But hummingbirds ignore the smelly flesh of dead animals. Instead, they look for the colorful blossoms of desert plants. The vultures, look at this, they live on what was. They live on the past. Would you repeat that? They live on the past. They fill themselves with that which is dead and gone. But hummingbirds live on what is. They seek new life. Would you repeat that? They seek new life. They fill themselves with freshness and life. The hummingbird and the vulture always seem to find what they are looking for. And so will you. And so will you, so said evangelist Tom Farrell. So be a good finder. It's simply an application of 1 Corinthians 13. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, endureth all things. Uh, love, uh, love is a good finder. Is that, is that who you are? Uh, if you want to have overflowing joy, if you want to have joy that that is seen by God and others, then you got you to gotta stop focusing on the smudge. You got to focus on the good. Can you do that? As a parent, you can't say, uh, why don't you act like your sister? Why don't you act like your brother? Smudge. Uh, you can't say to the coworker, if you would just stop that, we'd all get along around here. Smudge. You can't say to your spouse, you never, you always smudge. You can't say to your friend, well, you know, I just always speak my mind and you, I just tell it like it is. Smudge. You can't say to your fellow worshiper, a ah, sermon's too long, sermon's too short. I never did like that choir song. That soloist slid into that third, 16th note like a runner going into third base. Right? <laughs> Smudge! 
What are you looking at? What are you focusing on? Can you be a good finder because God tells you to? Have you met people who think they have the spiritual gift of criticism? <laughs> Become a pastor and you'll meet them. I mean, you just, just draw to you. You know that, that criticism is not a spiritual gift. It's a character flaw from a prideful heart. We're to live a life without complaint. We're to be rejoicing always. Chapter 4, verse 4. In fact, he's going to name two ladies who he tells they got to start getting along. Ultimately, our complaining is about God. How to choose joy. Let's move on. Shine your light. Do right. Shine your light. Do right. Verse 15. Look what he says. That ye, ye Christians in Philippi and at Valley Forge, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Uh, Bob Jones was born in 1883. Now that's not the Bob Jones that comes to our church, right? That's a different Bob Jones. He was born in 1883 and began preaching at the age of 12. By the time he was 40, he preached to 15 million people face to face. God used him greatly. He began a university. His most famous sermon was, Do right. He preached, Do right till, till the stars fall. Here Paul says the same thing. He says, Do right. As Christians, we're, we're growing to become blameless. Now, we're not that way, but God is changing us to become blameless. That means purity of life. That cannot be criticized. Harmless, uh, that means innocent and uncontaminated. Without rebuke, that means without fault. It describes a sacrificial lamb, a lamb without spot or blemish. Now, it's three ways to say the same thing. God is my father and I am his child. Uh, many parents and many kids have a family resemblance, don't they? I mean, you look at this and say, yeah, they belong together. Uh, we are to say, I'm born of God. God's DNA is now a part of me. It's in my soul. And the older I get, the more I look and act like my heavenly Father. I'm growing up. Be ye holy, for I am holy, God says. 1 Peter 1.15. God the Father doesn't complain, neither should we. Be who you are in Christ. Let others see on the outside what you really are in the inside. It's good. Notice what also he says. He calls us lights. He says, we are lights. You shine as lights in the world. Christian, we are to shine like the sun, moon, and stars. Christian, we are to shine like stars surrounded by a, a sky of darkness. We teach our children that little song. How's it go? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Jesus said, you're light of the world. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see what? Your good works. So, so now we know what light is. Light is good works. It's doing the right thing. Many unbelievers, uh, when they come to this place, may they sense the love that we have for Christ, the love that we have for each other. But it won't always be easy. Why? Look what verse 15 says. Because we live in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Right now, right now, today, more so than ever in the history of our country, people call evil good. People call good evil. I'm going to give you an illustration of this. Crooked is the word for scoliosis. It is the curvature of the spine. It's this, it describes something that's messed up, something that's not right. Something that's broken. But look what he says. Look what he says in verse 15. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. I know, I know you don't like hearing this word, but it's in the Bible. This is what God wrote. Perverse nation. It intensifies the meaning. It refers to someone who has strayed far off the path. I mean, they're, they're lost in the wilderness. Their departure from the normal, it's twisted. It's Distorted. Jesus used the word himself in Luke 9, 41. He said, oh, faithless and perverse generation. It's twisted. It's out of sorts. It's not normal. Do we live in a perverse nation? 
Right now, the most obvious example are the transgenders going after the children of America using library reading events. You do the internet search, transgenders reading in library, this is what you see. That's what you see. Don't hate this man. Don't hate this man. Feel sorry for him. Pray for him. This man is deceived. This man is a deceiver. He actually thinks he's doing a good thing. Look at the little kids in front of him. He thinks he's doing a good thing. He is sincere, but the Bible says he is sincerely wrong. He is sincerely wrong. And this is happening all across America. Brainwashing of our children. Do you know what happened in Lansdale this year? I'm not talking about California and Washington, D.C. I'm talking about right here this year, Lansdale. What about the parents who would take their children? You think that would scare them. Parents who would take their children to listen to this man read twisted books. They're blind to God. They're blind to common decency. They are, as Paul said, crooked. They are, as Jesus said, perverse. And the only thing that will help them is Jesus Christ. Now, what I have just said to you, understand, what I have just said to you is not hate speech. It is not hate speech. What I have just said to you is the truth. I am not transphobic, all right? I'm not transphobic. We've had transgenders attend our church. They are welcome here. They are welcome here. But the only thing that can help them is Jesus Christ. Amen. The only thing that can forgive their sin and my sin and your sin is Jesus Christ. And so we need to pray for this man and other people that are just like him. In the military, they want to use our tax dollars to pay for their elective surgeries. And I say, based on the Word of God, that's wrong. You join the military to defend our country. We find that in the Bible. It's in Romans chapter 13. They're to punish the wicked and protect the innocent. Defending the country is the priority of a government's military, not personal elective surgery. Does that make sense? Who joins the army and demands plastic surgery on their face? Ah, oh, I joined the army. I want a nose job. Oh, I want liposuction. Oh, I want a tummy tuck. Oh, I want a trans surgery. They need Jesus Christ. Look with me on page four. Put your faith in Christ. There's only one thing that can help these people. There's only one thing that can help everyone. Coming to Jesus Christ. And so we are called to share the gospel with them. We are all sinners. We're all sinners. We're all on the broad road that leads to hell. Jesus died for all of us, not just the elect. He died for all and rose again. And anyone can believe on Christ and receive him as their Lord and Savior. Yes, ours is a crooked generation. Ours is a perverse nation. We dwell in a wicked land where godless men like a Howard Stern can make profit on being perverse. In contrast, Paul says, there's the darkness, but we are light. We're the children of God. Shining God's light, that's how we live. Holding forth the word of life, that's what we say. Look with me in your notes. If you want God to use you to be a witness for him, you need both. We need, we need to live right, but we need to speak right. We impact people by who we are and by what we say. May I say that every day you are influencing others. Every day, right now, today, you influence others by how you live, and by what you say. You're doing it for good or bad, God or Satan. Look with me at the box. You can curse the darkness or light candles. Would you say that? You can curse the darkness or light candles. What did Dr. Shetler say a few weeks ago? He said you can watch Fox News and just complain or you can do something. You can do something. You know one of the smallest things that you can do if you're a member of Valley Forge Baptist or an attender? Not, well, we're getting to that one, but not park in the visitor lot. <laughs> I was just giving that note. It, 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 then you get to the first service, you just, you got it. Uh, not park in the visitor lot because we want people who may be visiting who don't know the Lord, we want to get them in here. 
Do the smallest thing. Don't just curse the darkness, but light candles. A philosopher Hein in Germany said, Show me your redeemed lives, and I might be inclined to believe in your Redeemer. Number five, how, how to choose joy. Share your faith with others. Uh, what is the word that gives life? Holding forth the word of life. Well, that would be the gospel. Jesus saves. Paul says, stop complaining and share the gospel. Why? Because in the day of Christ, when I get to heaven, I will have greater rejoicing. Paul says, do it for God, do it for Christ. And he says, do it for me, do it for your pastor. Four years ago, Herb Holzendorf and his son and daughter, daughter-in-law, they were at a nice restaurant around Christmas in San Antonio, Texas. And they began talking to a couple nearby, and they met Antonio and Sonia. And Herb shared his testimony. He shared Christ. And uh, the man actually bought his meal. Herb said, if, hey, if you're ever near us, stop in and see me. And they exchanged cards. Hasn't heard from him for four years. Two weeks ago on a Wednesday night, Herb gets a call. Thinks it's a telemarketer. Marketer. Herb, it's Antonio. Who? It's Antonio. Remember, remember? In San Antonio. Oh, yes, yes, Antonio. How you doing? He says, not so good. I have cancer. I have cancer in my kidney. Would you please pray for me? And Herb says, absolutely. But Herb didn't stop there. He has a small group of uh, praying friends around him, and they prayed for Antonio. And that, uh, they didn't stop there. He, he, he got his address, and they all sent him get well cards. And he didn't stop there. On Wednesday, he told me, and Herb and I went to my office, and we prayed for Antonio. And I, I wrote him a letter, and I, I sent him a couple of booklets, one about trials, and another one called Done, How to Become a Christian. And now I'm telling you that we'd pray for Antonio and Sonia for their salvation. And this week he had his cancerous kidney removed. Herb said to me, I would have never done that if I didn't come here six years ago. God has changed my life by coming to this church. I know there must be other churches out there like ours, but I haven't found one. I said, glory to God. It's the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of his word. Herb not only witnessed with joy, but he left a way for the stranger to contact him. Four years went by. How many times do we get a business card and we just throw it away? This guy kept it for four years. And when he had a need, he reached out to someone who he knew had the joy of the Lord and assurance of heaven in his heart. He said, I got to call him. And he did. Amen. Amen. Paul says you can choose joy. How? Obey God's word. Walk close to God. Stop complaining. Shine your light. Share your faith with others. What happens when you do this? Look with me at verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Uh, Paul speaks about a, being poured out as a drink offering. Uh, they would have ancient sacrifices, and on the hot altar, they'd pour the drink on it, and then it would vaporize, and that steam would go up, symbolizing going up to the deity. And Paul says, this is, this is a picture of me. If this is the end of my life, I may never get out of prison. I might die. It may be God's will for my life to be poured out. But if this is the end of my life, I want you to know I'm happy. I'm rejoicing that I spent my days serving you, sharing the gospel. And while thinking this, that this could be his final the single most serious thought a person could have, he's still able to rejoice. He refused to let the possibility of his death steal his joy. In fact, he urged his friends to rejoice with him. Look at verse 18. For the same cause also do ye joy. I might die, but I want you to joy. I want you to rejoice with me. I mean, here is a seasoned and scarred missionary, yet all the while he has this keen sense of humor, and he's not going to lose it. Have you ever met some great saints like that? No matter how difficult life gets, they just keep their sense of humor. Paul, Paul was not super serious all the time. Paul wanted to make his Philippians friends smile. He wanted them to have joy in their heart. Can you find at least one thing to laugh about every day? Uh, okay, then look in the mirror. <laughs> Might help you out. 
Can you laugh at least one time a day? Experts tell us that laughter helps control pain in at least three ways in your notes. By distracting our attention, by reducing the tension we are living with, and by increasing the production of endorphins, the body's natural painkillers. Laughter, strange as it may seem, turns our minds from the seriousness and the pain and creates a degree of anesthesia. That's how God made us. God made us to laugh. Laughter gives a brief excursion away from the pain. Choose joy. The Bible says that Jesus took his disciples and they went apart for a while. Do you think Jesus ever laughed with his disciples? I do. It's not recorded, but I'm sure he did. If you go to Sight and Sound, you'll see him laugh there. He laughed. It's okay to take a day off. It's okay to enjoy life. It's okay to get a bowl of popcorn, a bowl of ice cream. It's okay. Take a vacation. Enjoy this gift of life that God has given to you. In your notes, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. God's gift to you is today. His greatest gift is the gift of salvation. Christian, let's serve Jesus Christ. And like Paul, let's enjoy the journey with great joy. With great joy. Choose joy. May we pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for this apostle who shows us in the midst of deep trials, in the midst of a grave situation, that he chooses to rejoice in the Lord regardless of the dire circumstances. May we learn from him and may you do the spiritual surgery and adjust our attitude that we will obey, that we will stop complaining, that we will seek to walk with you, that we will do good works and shine your light and that, yes, we'll share the gospel with others. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You'd say, Pastor, if I died today, I know I would go to heaven because there was a time in my life that I made a commitment to become a true Christian, a follower of Christ. What that means is that means that you believe that, that Jesus died for you and rose again and you're trusting in only him to forgive your sins. You may not remember the date, but you remember the time. You called upon the Lord. You asked for God's forgiveness. You became a Christian. You've got a Bible reason that you know you're going to heaven. You have assurance. If you had that, then you're not ashamed to be called a Christian. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Would you simply raise your hand as a, as a testimony that Christ is in my heart, in my life? I have the joy of the Lord. God bless you all over. You may put your hands down. You'd say, Pastor, I... I think I'd go to heaven. I hope I'd go to heaven, but I'm not sure. I have doubts. God brought you here today to hear the good news, the gospel, that God loves you. Jesus died for you. He rose again. And if you will have a humble heart and the faith of a child, you can believe that Christ died for you and rose again. You can make that commitment to become a child of God today. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. If you sense the Spirit of God convicting of sin, if you sense a tap in your heart, that's the Holy Spirit. Say yes. Say yes to God. <clears throat> and would you pray with me now? Right where you're seated. From your heart, God will hear the prayer of your heart. Pray with me now. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe Jesus died for me and rose again. Please, please come into my heart. Become my Lord and Savior today. Now, if you've just done that, welcome to the family of God. I want to pray for you. It's not about joining the church or getting baptized. It's about a a personal relationship with 
the God who made you and the God who loves you. I want to pray for you today. Would you simply raise your hand? That's me, Pastor. I just pray with you from my heart, and I meant it to receive Christ as my Savior. Anyone at all, just hold your hand up for a moment. Hold it up for a moment. I receive the Lord as my Savior. God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Father, thank you. Thank you for the power of your word. Now I pray for those Christians who may have lost the joy of their salvation. God, I pray that you would restore it to them and their focus will be upon Christ and that they might be used by you to share your love, your care, and your salvation with others. May you bless in this invitation him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we stand together, we're going to sing a song of invitation today. In my life, be glorified. And maybe you want to pray in your seat. Maybe you want to pray at the altar. If you want to speak to a pastor, a pastor's wife, it is a, it's a public invitation. You can step right out. You come as we sing together. In my life, be glorified.